volunteers to everybody. It, it's it's remarkable. Like the entire event, the caretaking, I forgot my phone charger, Lauren saved me. I needed a Diet Coke. Amy saved me. So I'm just really grateful to everybody. Um, and I'm grateful to all of you for being here. This is a very odd shape. I'm gonna do that a lot. Um, and I'm thankful to everybody on this panel both and that a lot of them shared work with me in advance of that. So I've been reading and listening to things. Um, and so I'm gonna give you, even though you've met about half of them at this point, I'm gonna give you little praises on each of them. And I didn't write it in the order in which they wound up sitting, so I'm gonna have them just give you a little wave as I talk a bit about them. So we're gonna start with Greg Edwards. He is a lyricist, a playwright. He wrote books and lyrics to two of the Take a Ten podcasts, which we've heard a bit about today, and one of which you're gonna to see tonight. He is also a computer game designer. He writes essays and humor pieces, and he has some laugh out loud funny insights into working in India and going to Disney Paris. I encourage you to seek those out online, or to hit him up in person to tell you some stories. We also have Donna Hoke. Have I said that right? Yeah. Awesome. She is a playwright, a blogger, a regional rep for the Dramatist Guild, a moderator of the official playwrights of Facebook, page with helpful career building insights, as well as special features of interviews with artistic directors and literary managers, and interviews with playwrights who do not live in New York. Welcome, Don. Andy Romanton. Uh, as we know, he is the force behind the Take a Ten podcast. You will also hear two of his pieces tonight. Um, he is also a pianist, a music director, a composer, and a lyricist. And I wrote this last night, and then Georgia Stitz said something this morning that made me think maybe it wasn't as funny, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Uh, she said composers should work in lots of different forms. He has worked in forms as varied as bluegrass, ska bands, church choirs, and rappers. I have a feeling buy him a drink too, and hear some stories. <laughs> Jennifer Jasper is a storyteller, a writer, performer, a director, and author of solo shows and a number of short plays, including one you will see tonight. She also grew up having some intense dinner time experiences that will make you laugh and cringe at the same time. Find her at the bar, too. <laughs> I was listening to them last night, and I was like, oh my gosh, we had such quiet dinners in comparison to her family. Uh, and then Casey McLean, who joins me from New York, as we've heard, works at Samuel French and is the co-artistic director of their Off Off Broadway Short Play Festival. But she is also a lighting designer and is resident designer for Concrete Temple Theater, with whom she's toured to Sri Lanka, Turkey, Italy, Bulgaria, and India, which means I want a panel of Casey and Greg talking about international travel. <laughs> but not today, or at least not this afternoon. <laughs> So what we're here to talk about, and I love that we have a bunch of young people sitting at the table. Actually, by show of hands, who's a writer? Okay. Who's a performer? Okay. Who's a director? Okay. Any choreographers? All right. Uh, people who do web series? Okay. Producers? Okay. Anybody left from the Kenny Finkel related writers group that's doing the radio what? plays? Yes, okay, excellent, good. So, you know, I was gonna sort of make a point of how much we have multi-hyphenates up here on the stage, 
but also to make the point that we have a lot of you in the audience as well, and that's kind of what we're here to talk about, is to say, when you think playwright, or you think musical theater writer, you think, you know, they write a script that in playing time is 90 minutes or greater, and they attach it to an email, and if it's a musical, they attach some Dropbox files, um, and they send it out into the world to get it produced, but in fact, there are many, many other things that you can do, and the panelists may join me in saying you probably should do, uh, if you want to build a thriving career. They are all doing that, and we are going to talk to them about that. I am not going to make each of you, because we only have an hour, answer every question. So if you have a dying need to answer something or say something, please leap in. Um, but we're just going to kind of start by saying that if we all simultaneously agree that sitting in your writer's garret writing is no longer sufficient to having a career, why do you think that is? Talk into your microphone, we're live streaming. Nobody knows you're there. Uh, if you're just sitting at home, you, you have to be out, show, making sure people see the work. And, and Casey, as somebody who, with half of your hat on, is, is the person that artists are trying to access, what are some of the things they could do to find you, to get to you? Where are you paying attention to things? Well, to the city. Right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. 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 I love this festival. Um, that's a hard. It's also a hard question too, because it's also like, where do I look? Where do where do the artistic directors, where do the literary directors look and work in front? You know, um, one of the things is, is like, you know, come be our friend. Don't stalk us, but be our friend. You know, be polite. Talk to us. Tell us things you're doing. Um, become Facebook friends with us. Then we see your posts. I mean, those are like little little things. Um, there's also conferences, this is a great opportunity, and I know that there's a couple other different conferences that are leaping out of my head right now that literary directors, artistic directors are at. Um, oh my goodness, you know, there's the submissions, of course, that's always a little long run, but if you get to know us and you, and you, we start to know who you are, we'll start to take note of your work and, and follow it. That's one of Great. Donna, since you interviewed 52 artistic directors and literary managers, was there a recurring theme to what made an artist pop for them, what made them pay attention to an artist? There wasn't. Um, and what she's referring to is a blog series that I did called Real Inspiration for Playwrights Project, um, which started out because people were complaining that submitting works cold was not ever going to get them anywhere. And I was convinced that there must be success stories to cold submissions. So I went in search of them, and that's why I did this series. Um, and they do exist, but what it ended up kind of morphing into was um, a primer. Is that on? But you can hear me anyway, right? Um, um, was a primer on, on how to try and get your plays produced. And there was a ton of advice that they gave, um, similar to what Casey's saying. And from my perspective, um, I think it all comes down to the same thing. You have to get your name recognized so that when that script crosses their desk, they're like, I've heard that name, or I, I know that person from somewhere. And you know, to go through everything that they talked about um, would be a lot, but it really is actually much of what Casey said in terms of just getting to know. <laughs> in terms of just getting to know the theaters that you want to work with and getting to know the people and submitting your work and <coughs> using the internet to, to build some name recognition for yourself. <coughs> But I, I suggest you go read that. It's R-I-P-P -P on my blog, um, and it's still archived, even though it's like two years old. Great. And Jennifer, you were nodding your head through a lot of that. So you're a Seattle-based. I am. I'm Seattle-based, and, and um, it's very hard for me to find a Garrett to write in. So <laughs> um, <laughs> it's the last thing on my list. Usually you have to shove me in and shut the door because I'm doing too many other things. Um, but I would say, you know, submission and, and you know, get a website going. Get yourself present and, and go to functions like this and network um, and submit. You know, who? Why is it going to hurt, right? Why not try it? Because amazing things can happen. Um, I had a submission process that amazing things have happened, and now I'm here two years later. Um, so, yeah, I think and and also you know don't be um, don't be afraid to follow the road that your life is leading you on. Like, if somebody had ever told me I was going to be up here as a playwright, I would have laughed at you. Because I've been doing theater since my teens, and I'm now in my fifth decade, and I'm doing something I would have never thought that I would do, but it's all led to this point. So all the experiences and all the stuff I've done up until this point has gotten me here. So 
Never say no. Great. And I love that you highlighted having a website because this is a fight I have a lot with a lot of artists who say, you know, I haven't done enough. Why am I doing a website that just looks, you know, egomaniacal? So having been on a lot of your websites and having a somewhat reluctant tech guru on this panel as well, um, let's let's talk about what makes a good website. What do you look for when you go to other websites and you're doing some homework? Um, what came up as you were designing your websites? At what point in your career did you do them? I married a graphic designer. <laughs> <laughs> Always helpful. And, and so let, let's so un, let's unpack that. So when did you first build a website? When you got married, or? <laughs> um, well, she was like, she was like, uh, you know, you need to do more, you know, in marketing and everything else. You don't market yourself, which I'm horrible at self-marketing. I don't. I think a lot of artists are. I hate tooting my own horn. It's really difficult for me. And finding somebody, whether it be your spouse or your partner or a friend or somebody who really believes in who you are as an artist, and they push you, listen to them, and let them help you. Let the people who want to help you help you, I guess. Um, because for me, it's really hard, even though I'm a solo performer, it's really hard for me to push myself as that. So, great. Was there a thought process behind what you curated to put on your website? And I'll, I'll say, admit that that's a somewhat leading question. You have some photos on your website that I have to say it takes about 1.4 seconds to get an impression of who you are. Yeah. It's fast. Yeah, and, and that's like people who came to see shows and, and took photos of me and, and also the graphic designer element. But I did it specifically to get my solo work out. So that's when I really started pushing the website was when I was developing my solo shows. Great. Does anybody want to talk about how they kind of curated what they put of themselves online? Sure. Um, I should preface this by saying um, I do have a website, um, but unfortunately my graphic design skills are on par with my fashion. Um, so it's about like one step above inserting your eyes into a shredder. However, um, for the audience that doesn't probably go at this. I, when designing my website, um, I, I wanted to make sure that information about the various um, shows and essays and whatnot I worked on were all available. So I break it down into these sections, kind of like each of the different platforms that I work in, um, namely theater, essays, games, and I think that's it. Um, and then for within each, within each platform, having written down the various projects that exist, um, just things like and someone who's trying to learn about me or someone who wants to do the work would be interested in. For instance, what are some highlights from the work? What are, for the plays, what are the character counts? If these have been reviewed, um, what are the most flattering critical quotes taken out of context? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and then also just, I'm, I'm also, I imagine like most writers, really bad at self-marketing. I hate talking about myself. Um, he said, well, talking about himself. And so for me, uh, most of it is just being like, okay, I will put my website in my email signature and call it a day. Um, so I called it a day roughly six years ago, and just hopefully, like, when people need to find me online, if they've ever emailed me with me before, they know my web address. Um, if they Google me, um, I am not the uh, black comedian, um, <laughs> but uh, two or three slots down, but that's me. <laughs> I'm not the farmer's insurance agent <laughs> from Phoenix or the soccer player from California. <laughs> 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 Is it helpful to unpack that at all? So there's an organization called the National New Play Exchange. It's run by this amazing force of nature named Nan Barnett. Um, and they have member theaters and core members and associate members. And they put plays into their own pipeline where if multiple theaters choose to produce the same play and everybody does their own standalone production, their own actors, their own directors, um, they each get a little bit of funding to be a part of the what they call the Rolling World premiere. They can have kind of 
you know, group confabs to talk about marketing challenges or casting challenges. Um, and one of the things that NNPN did to further disrupt the system was that they decided the, the sort of agent submission to theater process was uh, not the most effective process on the planet. Debate amongst yourselves outside this panel. Um, and so they created what's called the New Play Exchange, or NPX, and you can very, very simply um, upload uh, a snippet of a play, you can upload the full script of something, you can have your contact info. Uh, Georgia said earlier this morning, you know, one of the things she had to do was just make sure she was findable. Um, and that's, that's huge. I mean, I use the New Play Exchange to find people, and I'm an agent. You would think I would know how to find people, but I will go on and say, you know, are they represented? Where are they represented? What's their email address? Um, so it's definitely a super handy way if you're a writer to get material out there. <coughs> Uh, yeah, and I was just going to say, my partner, um, he's in e-commerce, and his e-commerce he works for major fashion brands, but I actually pick his head all the time because he's one of those guys who, I don't want to dumb it down, but he makes you Googleable. So he's, he knows all the tricks and, and tips and spins, and, and e-commerce isn't just for Nike or, you know, Gap. It's for us, too. It's for theater. Um, I know Facebook is one of the quickest ways that I learn about events. And I know it, it can seem like daunting and annoying to keep inviting people to Facebook events or things like that, social media, um, but it's actually really important. Like, I, I know a lot about people in this room just because I watch them on Facebook. You know, I'm always, I'm always watching you guys. Um, but that, it's important for us too. So, so my theater company, Concrete Temple Theater, um, our website is built actually very specifically for touring because we like to build um, visual shows that we design and do in New York. Um, we do and run them in New York for short snippets just so that we can get it up on a steep. But our, our actual like passion in life is traveling. We love to travel. So we build shows to travel to Sri Lanka and India and stuff like that. So our, our, our um, whole website is designed so that you can see our tour packages and, and that kind of stuff. So. Um, and is, as if we needed further confirmation as to technology facilitating communication, I just got texted a picture of myself on this panel. Quiet. <laughs> 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 so thank you. We <laughs> just did that. Um, so, so as you make choices of how much of yourself or your work to put online, as you decide, oh, you know, somebody in the audience posted 15 minutes of my solo show. Is 15 minutes too much? Do I want the whole thing up there? Um, you know, clearly making the choice to put podcasts out in the world. H how do you decide how much? Is there a too much? Um, well, I think you talked a bit about it. Um, I, I'm very specific. Um, and I don't allow anyone to film any of my work. And usually I have people at the theater going around and, you know, my wife is one. <laughs> she sees you with a camera, she'll be like, no. Um, uh, so um, I do have Vimeo, but it's all passworded for when I apply for grants and stuff. I only want them to see it. However, I do do a storytelling um, program down in Portland. I'm invited down there every once in a while. They're PDX, and they do. Um, and I sign a release, and my stuff is podcast with them and out, and there's a few on my website from that. And so those are very specific. I sign a release and I say yes, because they're a great source to get my material out to different areas that I wouldn't normally be. So I think it's you know your responsibility to make sure that people aren't filming you, because I, I was part of a show that we, we conceived and performed back in the early 90s, and not around five years ago, I found it, and like uh, somebody had filmed the show and had put it out on the web, you know, and it was like, oh my gosh, our script is out there that anyone could have taken it. I don't think anyone has, even though it was brilliant. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> has anyone gotten a call about work because of putting themselves out there, either as specifically a theater writer or a, uh, a through ancillary work? We have Georgia Stitt wants to leap in. I was like, you weren't asking you, everyone. <laughs> you're, you're a part of this conversation no matter where you sit. I've definitely gotten inquiries on my website because of videos on Awesome. She has definitely gotten the inquiry through her website because of videos that are on YouTube. Um, I know. I know that people have gotten things through NPX. I have heard success stories about that, and I wanted to speak to, 
you could put up a sample or a whole play, but Gwydion Sullivan, who um, is the project manager for NPX, has said that like 90% of theaters want the whole play up there. And also there's an opportunities module whereby a theater will put out a call for plays through NPX. You will not get notification of that if your whole play is not up there. So that's just something to think about and know. Um, but to answer that question directly, um, I can't say that I've gotten an absolute direct hit, but since I increased my web presence and had a website, I've definitely gotten more work and more productions. I don't think I became a better playwright. I think that people just started to recognize the name. Um, so I can't really point, you know, quantitatively to what made that happen, but I think it's just kind of a momentum building. And for me, I've, uh, my experience has been primarily getting cross-platform work in that because of my travel blog to India, I ended up getting my first off-Broadway show, which was commissioned by a travel agency that wanted a show about travel. And apparently they wanted people to like travel, so I don't think they read my blog that closely. <laughs> it's such a funny blog, you have to hunt it out. Um, and, and also, like, for, uh, I had also do travel writing. Um, I'd written, as part of a travel blog, about my experience at Euro Disney. And a, a friend saw it and submitted it to a contact he had at the Los Angeles Review Books, and then it ended up getting published there, um, being reframed as a culture essay. So, like... <laughs> Mind of culture. Um, so yeah, I, I guess my experience is like I when I when I work cross platform, it's not for the the conscious purpose of hmm, I'm going to try to get a job in the least direct way possible, right. um, but rather just especially with theater, you're so beholden, especially with musical theater, you're um, so beholden to the schedules of others that when a particular project is on temporary hiatus, the choices are okay, I can sit there and do nothing, or I can work in another medium that interests me. And I have found that to be like, un unexpectedly useful in terms of getting work and uh, the mediums that I enjoy working in. Great, anyone else with a burning story to tell? So, so the big topic that I feel like I constantly have in my life is you know, sort of drain and work-life balance. And as I have been sitting at this conference the last two days, I've been planning a conference that happens in two weeks in Portland, because I, for a few more weeks, I'm the president of literary managers and dramaturgs of the Americas. So I literally just answered a text about seeing a walkthrough of the banquet space the morning we arrive. Um, and I will admit that there are times that I am just tired. <laughs> I'm almost too tired to ask the next question. Uh, you know, how do you carve out time to be people? I'm also an aunt, which is the one thing I will actually carve time out for. Are there things you will carve out time for? Do you think you're good at it? If so, give me tips. If you're bad at it, just make me feel better by saying that. I'm a terrible mother. <laughs> I suspect that's not true. That's a good thing that you have to make time for. Like your children probably have to eat, and once in a while they probably have They're to be bathed. Going to eat. The, I think for me, because I I have a lot of hats and a lot of different jobs, and I love like everything that I do. Um, but I also have a border collie. I don't have any children yet, but I have a border collie that I love to walk. So I spend. So I definitely carve out time for that. And and my partner is here conference with me. Um, but it's important to actually, you know, one of the good things about theater is you know there's a season and you know the months that you're busy. So if I just, you know, go, okay, January is going to be hell because we're busy to email French and I've got this show and this show and this show, but February, that's looking a little better. So as long as I can plan my a year in advance or at least six months in advance and I make sure that I'm free here and if somebody's like, hey, I've got this project and if it doesn't pay a lot of money, then I'll say no. <laughs> if it pays a lot of money, then I'll say yes. Um, and this is kind of, you mentioned it earlier with your tech job. Um, I, I do point of sale restaurant systems. Install point of sale systems for restaurants. <laughs> so I'm a little bit of a tech geek as well, for only in restaurants. It's even super geekier. But, um, and I get really passionate about it. But, um, but I did that for like 12 years and traveled a lot and really kind of disconnected from my theater and worked and worked and worked and got myself out of debt. And that was my priority to get myself to a point where I could, you know, at, at an older age, then be able to take more creative time. And I budgeted down within, like, I am very, very tightly budgeted. But I've gotten to the point, and this kind of refers to the panel previously, 
It's taken me, I'm in my 50s, and I'm now finally at the point where I'm 50-50. I'm 50% work for money and 50% work for me, and creative, and I'm hoping to keep making that, that percentage of me time be more creative and get more <coughs> flexibility. But even now, even carving out two and a half days, it's still very hard to find enough time for all the different hats in those two and a half days. So it's always a struggle, but. Um, I want to say, I mean, at a point, I'm at a point where most of my pain work is still not theater related, and you know, if I want to get to the point where it's the other way around. I had a teacher in high school who taught finance, and one of the things he taught us then was, you know, when you're doing your monthly budget and you're trying to save money or invest, always pay yourself first, and then whatever money is left for the rest of your stuff. So I kind of take that mentality with this. So the first thing I do every morning is make my submissions, because even if you're not writing, you still have work that you need to be getting out there. So that's the first thing I do, the first hour of the day, what new submissions are there, what do I need to get out, so that even if I'm not finding the time to write, I'm still doing the marketing, which will keep the momentum going until you can carve out that writing time. So that pay yourself first mentality works really great with that, um, and working out too. <laughs> Yeah, that I would definitely recommend. Always be marketing, even if you're not creating. Great. So we have a bunch of students here who are in the pathway of life of deciding where they're going to school, maybe if they're going to school, where they're going to live. Um, we've got Florida-based artists. Um, we've got panelists from a variety who live in a variety of places. So clearly you do not have to live in New York in order to be an artist. The panel answers this. But can we unpack a little bit about where you live having impact on career, um, choices people have made with that regard, choices they maybe regret, choices they are thrilled about, um, knowing that you're possibly influencing future generations of decision makers and artists? <laughs> well, I'll recommend the series that I wrote called Tony <coughs> Playwrights Living Outside New York where I interviewed 10 really successful playwrights who don't live in New York City, and they all talked about what their journey was in their city. And I also recap them in a piece for HowlRound, but one of the big things that came out of it is that it does matter what city you choose to live in that's not New York City. Buffalo, for example, is horrible, and I live there. <laughs> it's a great theater well, town, but it's Buffalo. not a good place for a playwright. Um, you need to have a city that's, I mean, if, if you're talking about writers, it's a great place if you want to go act and build your resume, but um, for playwrights, not so much. But a theater that has um, connections to the new play sector, that has an NNPN for theater, that has an MFA in playwriting, that has something that is making people look at that city, that has a regional theater, um, any one of those things is, is an arm into the new play sector. So you don't want to be like Buffalo, where you're like a, you know, a bridge, you know, an island with, with no bridges outward. Um, so I think that's really important. Um, I moved from Albuquerque, uh, that's where I got my degree, and I moved with an improv company that we were five years in Albuquerque, and in the late 80s, because there was nothing happening in Albuquerque. There's a little something happening now in Albuquerque. There's much more theater now than there was back in the late 80s. Um, and we decided to move to Seattle, which was just starting to really get its theater legs underneath it, and, um, and the small theater community booming. And it's now really vibrant, and it's an amazing place for new plays and new playwrights. So, um, and, it's, and, and if you're in the tech industry and want to work for Amazon, it's awesome. Um, but um, it's a really great city where, and, and I'm finding it's a really young theater's town. There are people who are just digging their feet in and doing new work constantly. There's lots of um, theater opportunities for people. And for playwrights, it's a great place for a new playwright to get their work produced and workshopped. Um, so, I mean, even though, and it's taken me how many years living in Seattle to finally get work in New York. So it's kind of my... Sure. Yeah, and I'll just say, you know, as my company is in New York, we certainly like to get out of New York. Um, New York is a very jaded theater town, and, and, you know, as much fun as it is to have all your friends there, the audiences are very like, yeah, okay, that piece, blah, 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 blah. You know, they're all, they go on for days, critiques, and then when we go to somewhere else, like, we'll go domestically, too. Um, we did um, Colorado Shakespeare, uh, or Colorado French, uh, last February, and you just go to these places that don't have lots and lots of art, and you bring a piece in, and they're just like, oh, wow, that was so amazing. I saw theater, and there was a live cellist on stage, and there was puppetry, and like just things that they don't see. Like, New York is just convenient for us, because we all live there, but you can live 
anywhere as long as you're passionate about knowing what you want. And, uh, and also, you're going to school, you're probably going to change your mind in three years. Lord knows I was an actor and then a director and now a lighting designer, you know. What will I be in five years? I don't know. I don't know, looking forward to seeing. Yeah. Uh, so Andy, one of your kind of other platform capacities is that you serve as a pianist and a music director to other composers and musical theater writers. <coughs> and I imagine there are days where that's amazing and you watch somebody fix a problem and it shows you how to fix a problem in one of your own shows. And I imagine there are days when you think, you're an idiot, why am I supporting you? Why am I not working on my own work? Is that true? Or everyone's a genius? I am. Uh... I work mostly in musical theater and regional theaters and, and kind of work that's already been established in classes and stuff. So okay, it's so very, it's, it's past a certain litmus test. It's not really, I'm not working very often with new composers on new works. Uh, I've done readings here and there, but when I'm a music director, I'm just there to present what they've given me. And exploring somebody else's score with that level of depth, is there a journey for yourself as a composer doing that? Um, only that, I mean, yeah, well, part of why I started the podcast was just being frustrated with seeing a lot of bad stuff get readings and producing productions and workshops and just being like, I know I can do this, I just don't have a venue. Um, but also, the better part is sometimes you, know, you see stuff that really inspires you. Um, I can't think of any, uh, anything off the top of my head besides like West Side Story or Chicago or something where I know it sounds kind of dumb and obvious to kind of bring up those, but getting to play West Side Story for six weeks, six nights a week, and every night discovering something in that score that was new every single night, and new and amazing, perfect and brilliant. Or Chicago, or Little Night Music, or whatever it is, and kind of learning from the classics and the greats that way is really informed kind of what I do as well. That's great. I have a, a totally tangential, non-fellow question. Um, so I, I can sort of imagine, like this morning, as watching Georgia do her her conversation, and I thought, I'm not a writer, but like I could picture writing a play or a book of a musical. Like a character talks and a character talks, and in theory, I could picture writing lyrics. Like there's a moon, it is June. There, I just wrote a lyric. But, but the notion of like sitting down and composing something absolutely blows my mind. So like. I couldn't ever write any of the essays that I was reading in my office this week, but I could picture writing an essay and putting it online. Um, but when you sit down to say, I'm going to create a podcast of short musicals, I would imagine there's 8,000 steps to making that happen. Uh, all right. Yeah. Well, well, you want to walk are, us through some of them? Are we talking about the, the music writing part or the podcast Well, you creation? know I'm obsessed with how you write them, and that may be another panel well, unto itself. Right. But sure, like, are you in the same room with your collaborators? Are you Skyping with them? Well, I'm just... I'm, the, the writing process itself is its own process. In terms of writing music, composition, that's, I'll just say to all the non-musicians out there, you're not non-musicians, or you're totally capable of any of that. Uh, it's just another language. It's just like learning another language when you took Spanish in high school or Latin. Music is just another language, and there's a language to it. There's a way you converse, and you talk, but also, you know when things get high, and you know when things get low, and you know when things get loud, and you know when things get soft. And that's pretty much the basis of all language and all music is just recognizing the boundaries and the opposites and all that. So that's music writing. Oh, there you go. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> and there's a collab. So, so this is, then there's the process of actually putting together a musical, uh, which even a, a 10 minute musical ideally takes months. Um, how, do, can you remember how long it took us for Evelyn Schaefer when we started talking about it? Um, I think both. Evelyn Schaefer and the Almost Emmaus took us maybe three months from that it? talking to having yeah. a final draft. Uh, that sounds about right. Um, there is a, another 10-minute uh, musical that's on the podcast, uh, which is called The Answering Machine, and it, it took about nine months for a 10-minute musical. Um, so that's my only kind of correlation with the like longer form, you know, five, six, 15-year musicals over there, <laughs> is it's like, that's kind of the equivalent. Um, uh, and that one went on to be go into this festival at, at, uh, called Sound Bites in New York and won Best Music and Best Lyrics, got produced in France and at a college in Ohio. Um, that was a success story. Then there was another one where we had two weeks to write it, and that's the one I'm still kind of embarrassed about. Um, <laughs> but that's just the kind of, so then there's the writing part of it. After that, there's the, once it's all written and rewritten, uh, then we go into, then there's sometimes readings that I would have, I try to get at least one reading of everything, or bring, try to get a song 
critiqued in the BMI workshop and try to fix that, and then recording the actors individually for the most part. Um, so I'd record all their dialogue, uh, rehearse and record their songs. But, but hang on. Yes. Meaning like there's six people in your closet with yep. your microphone in your garage band? Do you have a studio? Time. One at a time. Yeah, my okay. closet, it's, uh, it was just me. I bought a microphone and an audio box and I'd sit on my bed and the cat would be knocking over stuff, uh, which was really helpful when the actress was allergic to cats. Um, uh, but yeah, so then it's recording that and uh, kind of trying to bust it out and try to get several takes of each, uh, each line. Um, and even sometimes if the actors have trouble with the song, actually for Evelyn Schaefer, uh, the actress, <laughs> it was, she was our, our third actress to play that role because the first, first one had scheduling conflicts, the second one got sick, and then it was like, okay, well we need to get this done in 24 hours. So we found somebody who was willing to learn all three big epic solo songs and then record them the next day. And uh, she was not, not quite as, as quick a learn, quick learner as uh, I expected. So at times I had to record one bar at a time and then put them together. So if you listen to the actual podcast, that's the culmination of me putting together one bar at a time, fixing that note, and you know, moving things all around. So then, okay, so then there's the editing and then putting together where there's a conversation. You can hear these conversations between these actors and it sounds, sometimes it sounds like they're in the same room, and uh, almost certainly they were not recorded at the same time. Um, and then it's editing together so that it sounds like they're listening and reacting to each other. So figuring out which take sounds like they're listening the best, placing them apart, how much distance between the lines would be, are they overlapping, whatever it is. Are there certain nonverbal reactions, like grunts or laughs or whatever that we have to put in. And then, you know, recording to a piano demo track. And then after that piano demo track, orchestrating it with all my fake instruments on GarageBand and Logic. And then mixing, remixing, putting that together, sending it to the collaborators, is this okay? No, okay, fixing it, taking it back, is this okay? Until midnight of the first of the month every month. Jennifer is thinking to herself, I'm so glad I'm a solo artist. <laughs> <laughs> my, my wife is a musician and she's wanting to start to do musicals together and I'm hoping you're listening to this. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be a conversation together. But I'll tell you what, in terms of your last question before this, or uh, whichever one it was about budgeting time. Yeah. Uh, I have no idea. Yeah. Um, I don't all either. I, all I know is I started off by saying I'm going to get this done on the first of the month every month. And at the end of the first episode, I said, next month, on the first of the month, and every month, we're going to have a new 10-minute musical for you. And I remember after I released that first one, I came home for Thanksgiving break, and my mom said she generally liked it, except for this one character that she hated. So yeah. that's my mom. Uh, that it was, she, she was like, it was pretty dumb of you to say first of the month every month. Because now, you know, you should have said, you know, periodically or from time to time. <laughs> and I said, no, because otherwise it would never get done. Yeah. So I'm a big believer in deadlines and pushing your back to the cliff, which is a metaphor relating back to the story of these ancient uh, Spartans fighting the Persian uh, army. I don't know what the 300. Anyway, uh, so there were 300 Spartans who were up against a 10,000 person Persian army. And they were just. They were, they were clearly screwed. That was the understanding was there are 300 of us and there are 10,000 of them. There's no way, there's absolutely no way we can win. And so the general said, all right, well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go up to that cliff and when they come up, then we're gonna take them. And the soldiers were like, that is crazy because we will not be able to retreat because there's a cliff behind us. And the general was like, yep. And so- well, we have Gerard Butler, so it's okay. Yeah, exactly. yeah, I know that. Um, so for me, I got that podcast done because it had to come out and there were a lot of sleepless nights and a lot of last days of the month where I got nothing done. Couldn't go out for Halloween or New Year's Eve. You know, there were several times where that was the case. Even actually my birthday is on the 29th of the month and uh, my parents were visiting me in New York and uh, they were visiting up for my birthday. We went out to see show. Actually, we saw Honeymoon in Vegas, by the way. And, um, and after the show, I said, great, I now have to go to Brooklyn to record a violinist. And they took me, and you know, that was kind of, and it came out on the first of the month, and uh, at 2 a.m. or something like that, me just staying in there, remixing. And there's a lot, there's a lot that you can do if you just make yourself do it. And so with budgeting, if you just say, I will do this, or otherwise I will die. Or something, if you, and that's called stakes. That's called life and that stakes, right? Where 
Would, would I have died if I didn't make it? No. But I couldn't make that one deadline, and that's why I'm on hiatus right now. And it's great to have all that extra time right now. And I look back and I think about all the time I've put into it, all the ridiculous hours, and I, I can't, I literally, I cannot figure out how I did it. Yeah. Because right now, I feel busy, and back then, I felt busy, but I was doing twice as much work. So it's really just making yourself, giving yourself a deadline, and you'll come up with something, which is why musicals very often have reading and reading and reading, because you need that reading, an excuse to like, those actors are gonna need to learn this material in time, we gotta get it done. And uh, I'm a big believer in deadlines because of that. Yeah, 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 no, definitely. Um, so we've been talking a lot about other platforms in terms of sort of self-created platforms, but of course there are platforms that already exist out in the world. City Rights is one of them. You're a writer, you want to come and network, here's a place to come. Um, the Off Off Broadway Play Festival with Sam French is one. Um, and, and Casey, can you talk us through a little bit about how do you reach out to writers to make sure people are applying? I know at least one short play has become a full-length play because Joe Colarco is directing it at the Signature this season. So have there been collaborations or projects that have become even bigger than that festival? Um, yeah, well, we're 41 years old, so we're an old festival. And um, we have had a lot of great, Teresa Rebeck, we found her through the festival, which is, you know, she's okay. Um, <laughs> she's a um, Shirley LaRoe um, wrote a short play for the festival that then went on to be a full length on Broadway. So um, you don't know what's gonna happen, Jennifer here, she left our festival and was it you were at the airport? I was at the airport. Yeah, I uh, and it was just like what a crazy thing to be doing the festival and then ended up one of the six winners and that was even crazier. And um, we were at the airport leaving and I got an email and I got an email from a producer in New York who happened to see Friday night show and said, I loved your play and I want are you still in New York? If you are, I'd love to meet with you. If you're already in Seattle, can I call you? And, I, and she contacted me and said, do you have any full lengths? And I'm like, no, because I haven't really been writing for that long. And she said, how about more shorts? And I'm like, well, I do have some shorts. And so April 17th of next year, I have an evening of my short plays going up off Broadway. You never know. Yeah, you never know. So, like, another story that I'll have outside of the Off Off Broadway Festival. So, my company, um, we toured in India. That's Greg and I will talk about it later. Um, we toured in India for two weeks in 2008, and we submitted a play um, called The Whale. It's a one man Moby Dick. It's much better than it sounds right now. I'm just going to tell you that. Um, and to the only English speaking festival in India, which is in Chennai. And they were like, okay, yeah, that sounds great. Come on over here. So it was like full, full Moby Dick. Here we come. Um, so we went, and it was really cool. We saw some, like we saw. I saw one of the best plays I've ever seen. It was, it was the Indian piece. There was also Japanese people there, and like all these different it's Indian piece about what they thought of the American president. And it was like 2008, so it was like right before Obama. It was, so it blew my mind. So, but because we were going to this festival, they paid for our airfare there. Um, but then they were like, why don't you reach out to the U.S. Embassy? And so we did, and they were like, great, since they paid for the big airfare, why don't we tour you guys around? So then the embassy became our hosts for the next two weeks, and then they flew us to um, Kolkata and Dubai, and, oh, not Dubai, uh, Delhi and Bangalore. We ended up doing five other shows in India, and then they called their Sri Lankan embassy, and they were like, hey, we got these guys over here in Sri Lanka. It's like, great, send them over. And so then we did two shows in Sri Lanka. So like, and you know, there was also this American jazz band that was following us too. So the US embassy is actually a great booking agent, you guys. <laughs> like, they also like, we, we like, so in, we, we submit to these international festivals, and then when we get in, we call the local embassy, and like, we were staying at five star hotels. We were we were first off and, and last off on priority on planes. Like people would like the stewardess would come and she'd be like, Oh, you guys are concrete temple. Oh my god, you're big celebrities. <laughs> so like you never know what festival can lead to, you know, off Broadway or a whole tour of India. <laughs> and then a blog about travel. <laughs> Um, so, surprise question that we didn't discuss in advance, but I just feel inclined to ask it because we have the time. Um, 
I've become podcast obsessed over the last nine months, and, and one of my favorite things to listen to is Pop Culture Happy Hour, and at the end they always talk about what's making you happy this week. So it doesn't even necessarily have to be something from the art world, but I'm just wondering if there's, what do you turn to for inspiration, for sucker, for happiness, to keep yourself going? What's making you happy? I have, um, one thing that I do in Seattle is I curate a once a month um, cabaret night, and it's in a little tiny theater black box of like 55 seats. And I get different artists from around um, Seattle to do work about family. Because as, as an autobiographical storyteller, I think that that's uh, one thing that binds us together as family artists is the families that we make, the families that we're born from. And um, I get five different artists from different disciplines. So for me, it's really important that the literary world meets the theater world, meets the music world, and that we get different artists from different um, disciplines into the same house because we rarely mix. And um, they, the only thing is we have to do something about family. And then we raise money every month for an artist in need. So somebody's having trouble making rent or they're in a medical crisis and we raise money. So my favorite night of the month is every third Wednesday and my favorite morning of the month is every, thurs every third Thursday morning when you wake up. And it just makes it all kind of, it's that connection and um, makes you feel good for doing the work that we do. Great. Anybody else? Something that makes you happy? I'm, I'm gonna, I'll speak again. Um, just to, so like something that um, is important to me and my community theater, or my theater is community. So we, we actually have a couple different ways that we reach out. We work with senior citizens on writing plays and doing performances. We go to schools, we teach the schools. I work with a lot of autistic children to teaching them theater. And actually, when you get out of your like professional bubble, um, and you still get to do theater, it's so rewarding. And plus, you are connecting with the community, and you're also growing yourself an audience, um, because then they start to support you, and they start to come to things. So for me, it's when we get to do those other collaborations, yeah. workshops, and such. I think that that's a big thing, like being represented for the Guild. Um, I do a lot of stuff in my community for playwrights. Writing my blog, which is really about advocacy, inspiring playwrights. Um, I think playwrights, you know, can get into that meeting me in my workplace very easily. And by doing that kind of service stuff that, that both of you have talked about, um, it just takes you out of that and it just makes you part of the greater community so that you're not so focused on what you have happening and you just, you're giving back and it just makes you forget about that and then, you know, things happen anyway, so. Uh, I, I'm far less altruistic than I'm wondering. Thank God, like, I, I, I was gonna say spy novels when I was over here feeling horrible. <laughs> <laughs> when, when I need to feel happy, um, I ignore artists in need, and, <laughs> and read him. <laughs> I read Calvin and Hobbes. <laughs> uh, and I, when I was young, I think I owe a lot of my artistic sensibility to Calvin and Hobbes. When I was young, every year I would like reread the entire like what seven volume set. Um, and I haven't done it in years, but I still just have most of the comics like seared into the base of my brainstem. And I think it's, I, I think the, the simplicity of the storytelling, the beauty of the art, and the combination of like uh, human truths, hilariousness, and the most awesome evil babysitter ever are what I aspire for in my own work. <laughs> Andy? Uh, could you repeat the question? Yeah. <laughs> it, do, it doesn't have to be anything in the world of art, but what do you turn to to kind of recharge, reconfirm, get back in touch with yourself, let go? What makes you happy? Uh, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. <laughs> we have young people in the room. Okay. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah, what do, what do I, I, it's a hard question. Uh, I'm very lucky that I get to do what I love for a living. I get to play piano, I get to make music, I get to hear a lot of extremely talented people sing right in my face. Um, uh, it's it's great. Uh, I, I got nothing good for you. I, I love okay. watching Netflix and chilling and just being bored and, and it's lazy and it's terrible. So I, I have to force myself to do other stuff. All right, let's let's do this in a wave. Things that make you happy. What helps you recharge? Books you've loved. Any ideas? Impulses? I'm in my garden. 
Gardening? Oh, yeah, I, I go to my, I jump in my plastic pool. <laughs> Perfect. Anyone else? Yes. Frankie and Gracie. Excellent. Perfect. Not even cast albums? You put on like Sweeney Todd and run around your living room singing at the top of your own? Why? Fine. <laughs> okay. Any, anybody back there? I'm with him. Calvin and Hobbes. Calvin and Okay. Interesting. Two votes for Calvin and Hobbes. All right. What do you turn to to recharge, reinvest? Travel. Excellent. Travel. You took mine. You uh, took mine. Travel. You can go together. The beach. The beach. Some camp that I run. Excellent. With his, with his. You may have just won that answer. We'll let people keep trying. <laughs> Elizabeth, anything? Meditation. Great, meditation. We can probably all take a, where's my yoga teacher? Is he still here? The guy who came in from yoga class? There you go. Yeah, go talk to him. Over here? Things that help you recharge or re-inspire you? That's a hard question. Uh, Susie? A long Saturday at the Winn-Dixie shopping. Walks in nature, clearly none of you live in Brooklyn. Excellent. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yes? Cuban coffee. Oh, yeah. oh. Woo. Yeah. Woo. Yeah. Yeah. You're not from Miami. Let's get something to get. Yes, I've already been pitched on the Cuban coffee, but the description say. scared me. Um, <laughs> All right, young people, wave of the future. What's inspiring you? Snapchat. Yeah. Oh, don't talk to him. I dance like a lunatic. I lock myself in my room and pretend that I'm a superstar. All right. Finally. <laughs> um, art history. I like learning a lot about art and artists and stuff. I'm sorry. Awesome. <laughs> yes. I, I have a client, a playwriting client, who says everything he understands about how to structure a play, he learned from reading uh, architecture reviews, that when he would read architecture reviews and people would talk, architecture critics would talk about how the structure of a building worked or didn't work in relation to itself, in relation to the buildings around it. Somehow those dramaturgical impulses about building an architecture spoke to him about how to structure a play. So, you know, inspiration can come from anywhere. Binge watching TV shows. Excellent. Anything in particular? Uh, no. <laughs> Anything. I'm going to go for Catastrophe on Amazon. I listen to Glee and the Heathers. Excellent. I, um, I like watching uh, makeup tutorials, mostly drag Excellent. <laughs> Harry Potter. Always. Good standby. Sketching. I have this uh, full house box set with the first <laughs> nine seasons that I watch like once a month. Wow. I've been doing that since I was seven. Uh, have you watched Fuller House, house yet? No, I can't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, she can't. She says. Why is my I'd agree. Yeah. Awesome. Anybody else at that table? Yeah. Um, I guess uh, video games, they kind of help me unwind. Excellent. Video game designer. Talk to him after. <laughs> Other impulses from that table? Meditation and friends. Meditation and friends. Excellent. Okay. Table hiding in the back? Meditation and visiting my son and my grandma. Kids. Yeah. <coughs> Don't come talk to me about my nephews. I'll play your videos. Any, anybody else at that table? Great. Got a date over here. <laughs> caring, for, caring for animals. Oh, wow. and, and tell me a context. Um, well, I have a son, Conyard, that uh, flew into something and is having a hard time walking, so we do a lot of therapy in the days, trying to get her life to work better. And oh. Just, you know, basically stepping away from my desk and paying attention to the real world yeah. for like 10 minutes. That's awesome. Great. Th this line? Yeah, does the dog also get some soap in young Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Although she likes it for love. Dogs. <laughs> Other folks? Yeah. Hot yoga. Hot yoga. Hot yoga. Do you do hot yoga? Yeah? Okay. I'll watch my go-to if I if I really need like be inspired. I've watched Master of None a whole season. Yes. yes. 
Yes, love it, Michael Sheen. Yeah. <laughs> Other folks, inspiration? Phone calls with my 95-year-old grandma. Oh, oh. phone calls with his 95-year-old grandma. Excellent. Georgia, when you just need to cut loose and dance around, what do you listen to? Earth, Wind, and Fire. Oh. Amanda? Uh, Excellent. Yes. Jennifer? Um, we classic Hamlet. <laughs> she is such a musical theater person. <laughs> Great. So I think we have time for a couple of questions. So now that you're all warmed up, who has a question for the panels, for the room, for me? If not, I'm going to release you all early. Anyone? Questions? Don't be shy. That just means I did a really good job. Oh! <laughs> oh yes. Does anyone have a platform that they want to create while they haven't gotten the courage to try or it's not the way yet? Yeah. I'm looking at podcasting, which is why I was looking at you. Yeah. We would like to do a family affair podcast, but we have yet to get there. Great. Well, if he didn't scare you off. I know. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I would love to be involved with animation somehow. Oh. That's kind of, I was thinking about, you know, big inspirations. And, uh, like, Pixar is a huge inspiration, even though they're not musicals, but also lots of great cartoons, but also Adventure Time. Are there any Adventure Time? Like, yes, yeah. thank you. So, like, they get it. And it's, it, it's a cartoon on Cartoon Network, and it looks like it's for kids. And it looks, like, dumb from the outside, and it pretends to be. But it's so smart and morally complex. And the music, the score and the songs that they throw in and the choreography feel very kind of haphazard and random. Uh, just sort of accidental. But there's clearly it's so wrong in a sense. The music is so structurally it doesn't make any sense that it has to be the work of a genius and completely on purpose. Um, and there's a lot of brilliant animation work and uh, music and otherwise uh, going on. Awesome. Anybody else play? I would love to write in, in a serial format at, at some point. Like webisodes or? Um, anything serial. I mean, I used to work for Soap Opera Digest, and I have appreciation for the serial form and just staying with a group of characters for a long time. Great. Anybody else? Well, uh, last week I just did lighting for a fashion event, and it was amazing. Uh, <laughs> there was like no pressure. Great. <laughs> 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 I like it. Okay, I'm the one left. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, in the past years, I've been trying to, they have a couple TV writing fellowships where in order to apply for them, you need to write a spec script of an existing show. Um, so I've been putting together a spec script for that. Do you say what show you've been spending? Um, sure. I've been working on a Kimmy Sch Schmidt oh, script. Oh, oh. I'm going to read it. You're going to send it to me. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Susie, you had a question? Well, I don't actually have a question, but I want to, I do want to say that of all that all of you up there have spoken to things and interconnected, but that's why you're here, and that's how you got here. Um, if it was Casey inviting me to come in and um, and to Sam French, and then seeing Jennifer's work and starting to see what she's doing and that now she's doing this anti-bullying you know, anti-bullying girl thing which is part of what our tour is about that's very interesting to me and then of course seeing um what was going on with evelyn shaper i hate to say the name evelyn shaper because it gets in my head and then the song <laughs> in my head. i've been seeking it all day oh, <laughs> you guys will see today and the one from work that's the other one but um I mean, truly i'll get up at three in the morning and i'll have somebody's words floating around in there. <laughs> but because, so Sam French has been great because then I'm seeing new stuff, short format, sometimes longer than 10 minutes, but I like to see some, you know, like really what does, how is something different that runs 18 to 25 minutes different from what I'm looking at, you know? And, um, and then of course finding Donna through multiple layers of relationships and what you know just sort of following the things you're writing about has also informed opportunities or brought to light other writers that I think oh well that's somebody I should probably take a look at or go, go into NPX and try to find the work 
So, um, I mean, all of us that are sitting here right now, quite frank, running into France Luce at CNF French. <laughs> so just briefly, France Luce was my student 24 years ago. Don't yes. tell them how old I am. <laughs> we'll edit that out of the live stream. But she Too was late. Student, and I was supposed to direct a play, which I'm not a good director, but we didn't know that then. <laughs> and I was pregnant. And I said to her, I'm, you know, I'm gonna go have this baby and then I'll be back. It was the end of the school year. <laughs> and I'll, you know, and then I'll direct this play. And she wisely looked at me like, you know, I don't know that that's how that works. <laughs> but as it would turn out, it isn't how it worked for us, but we remained in touch. And then I was at Sam French and I was watching shows and I suddenly see her walk in and it led to this conversation, of, well, what are you doing? What are you writing? Why don't you send me something? And thus, the last couple of years, I've had to do two pieces of France Luce's in summer shorts, but she also became a playwright I commissioned for the tour. So, I mean, all of this in here, I could, you know, sort of go on and on because it's a few degrees, sort of as I said last night. But each of you is here right now for that same purpose. And I'm sure in conversations and drinks or listening to any of this and talking to these folks now that who we are all getting to know so much better, we are making connections that are leading to opportunities or ideas for collaborations and any other number of things. They may seem benign at the moment. So, well, she's been with me for six years. Every single city race. You are a veteran. Um, Susan Schulman. So um, that's all I really wanted to say to this. Uh, and Beth and I go back for many, many years as well. Um, but it is for you guys um, an opportunity now to be a cohort because years from now you all will be remembering how you met and how you first began to write or work in the theater and how you were helpful to each other or unhelpful. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes that happens. But, um, but then around here, you know, you, 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 that's what we're all telling you. We are telling you that because there's truth to it. So Facebook it. We'll see. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's so important. Thank you for saying that, Susie, because I think the interconnectedness of this industry, the sense of community, the falling out of touch with someone and then coming right back as if no time has passed, um, it, it is a testament to how to build a career. And I think one of the things that I like to do, what makes you happy, is also just a reminder that not everything always has to be about theater. And that, in fact, you know, watching a movie may help you crack a structural question or, or you know, those kinds of things. So I think that's really important. Um, any final remaining burning question from anybody? No? Okay. Everybody, run to the bathroom. We'll see you in a bit. Thank you. Thank you for having us.